The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Campbell, and I am the Assistant Director for the National Adult Protective Services Association. And I'm very happy to welcome you all to today's webinar, which is hosted by the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. So thank you all for being here. Today's webinar topic is self-care for APS workers. Next slide, please. And before introducing today's speaker, I'm gonna hand the microphone over to Andy for a moment to talk about the APS TARC. Thank you, Karen. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Capehart. I'm with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. And we have a quick disclaimer before we get started. The Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, as we call it, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. So, uh, next slide. A quick note about our APS TARC. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. Um, we'll have some contact information displayed at the end of the webinar so that you can reach out to us if you like. We work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Uh, next slide. We'd like to make a quick plug for our peer-to-peer -peer calls. We have three of these calls each month, um, one for APS workers, one for supervisors, and then one for administrators, respectively. You can see the schedule here on your screen. If you'd like to register for these calls, just visit our webpage and click on the peer support link for details. You can also reach out to us via the email displayed at the end of the webinar. If you'd like to join one of these calls, we'd love to have you. Uh, next slide. And then lastly, we encourage you to take a look at our APSN COVID-19 page. It contains some resource information, uh, a federal brief addressing personal safety, continuity of operations, and a summary of state program responses to the pandemic, and some other resources as well that are specific to adult protective services. So at this point, I'll turn things back over to Karen. Great. Thank you, Andy. Uh, next slide, please. All right, before getting started, I would like to provide some information about how to utilize and interact with the software that's being used for today's webinar. Um, a PDF of the slides is available for download in the handout section of your webinar control panel, and you can download those at any time during the webinar. Please use your computer speakers to access the audio for this webinar, um, and please make sure that the speaker volume on your computer is adjusted to um, your desired volume. If you are experiencing audio problems due to internet connection, speed, or any hardware issues, we recommend um, that you exit and then re-enter the webinar. Next slide, please. All attendees are muted, so if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to write those into the questions box, which is also located in your webinar panel. We will be responding to technology-related questions, and then content-related questions will be monitored throughout the presentation, and we'll read those aloud for the presenter to address. Um, additionally, this webinar is being recorded, and all registrants will receive an email when the recording is made available on the APS TARC website. And all attendees will receive an automatically generated email about 24 hours after the conclusion of the webinar, um, and this will also have a link to a certificate of attendance. Next slide, please. All right, and we have a quick poll question intended to get a better idea of, a better idea of today's audience. So Andy, would you please go ahead and launch that poll? Certainly, I have launched that poll now, and you should be able to vote by clicking directly on your screen. If you're in full screen mode, you might have to disable full screen mode to respond first. Um, I think it depends on your computer. But again, you can click directly on the screen to um, respond to this. Which of the following categories do you identify the most with? And um, adult protective services professional, other social services professional, uh, medical or legal professional, or other. Just click on the one that corresponds best to you, and we'll leave this open for just a few more seconds to give everybody a chance to respond. Looks like about half of our attendees have voted already, so I'll leave it open for about 10 more seconds. And then we will close it out and display the results for everybody. 
All right, so I'm going to close that poll now and then share the results with everyone. It looks like 86% of you are APS professionals. So 10% um, uh, other social service professional, 1% legal, and 3% to classify yourselves as other. So thanks so much for participating in that poll, and I will um, turn things back over to Karen. Wonderful. Thank you, Andy. And next slide, please. Great, and so today we will be hearing from Robin Pendleton, who is a Senior Staff Development Training Specialist for the Section of Adult Protective Services within the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Robin, and now I will hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Andy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Robin. Um, before we get started, I'd like to say that I do like interaction, and so I'd like for this to be as interactive as we can for the next hour. And so if you do have questions or comments, go ahead and put them in that chat box, and Karen will read those to me, and I'll, I'll answer them as best I can for you. Um, so to start this off, it's all about self-care, and it seems like here lately that's been a bigger deal to people this year than maybe in the past. And it's not that it's a bigger deal. I think it's just more on the forefront of people's minds because we've kind of been thrust into it. We've been put into a, a year of all kinds of things that have just taken a toll on us. And now people are starting to see that it's it's been there all along. So self-care, what it is, it's just any purposeful effort made by somebody to increase their own mental, emotional, physical health. And it's what rejuvenates us. It's what keeps us going, what makes us feel better. So why then is it so important and why is it so hard? And the, the short answer is it's not hard, but it's so hard sometimes too. And it's so hard because we face so many stressors. We truly do. Um, if you guys, I think uh, Andy said 86% of you answered you are APS um, professionals. So think about the stressors that you have in the job uh, and feel free at any point in time. Like I said, put some comments in there and Karen can get those to me, but here's just a few of them that we face just in the job. Our workload, it's not slowing down because of the COVID era. It's not slowing down because our populations are changing. It's just getting larger. So we're, we're getting more and more uh, caseloads and we have policies sometimes that, that seem to maybe slow us down or give us hiccups or things that just, they don't feel like they fit quite right. There's all kinds of things that are happening. We have challenging clients. We have computer systems sometimes that they don't work the way we'd want them to, or at all in some cases. The travel, our job more often than not requires us to travel. But right now during the COVID era, that travel is not necessarily happening the way that it used to happen. And so if we look at this COVID era, here's another list of stressors. Working from home, there are a lot of people who are begging school districts to take the kids back, or they're so thankful that they are and that they put all these safeguards in place so that their kids can go to school, but they're still keeping them safe throughout all this. And people are having this, this greater appreciation of teachers and they're recognizing that they're not a teacher and all these different things from just working from home. That travel that I talked about, I know here in Missouri, one of the things that I've heard from a lot of our workers is, it's not that they don't want to travel, or it's not that they have this fear of catching COVID, if you will. It's that sometimes that travel is not happening, and it is kind of case by case, and that's for the safety of our staff as well as the safety of our clients. But they're also af afraid that without the travel and those face-to-face -face contacts with their clients, that they're not picking up on some of those other issues and things that they would see inside that person's home or, or wherever they're residing that they would get as an ancillary piece to their case and it's not a part of the hotline and if they're making that phone call to do their interviews they may not be getting all that information that they would have seen and could have been addressed as well um, it, we've had clients pass away that in itself takes a toll on our staff they get emotionally vested to our clients and that's part of the job i mean that's part of what makes a great aps worker is that they do care about the people they're actually going out to see. Face masks and PPE are a realization too, and you have to have them. There are so many places that require them, and there are places that don't, but you feel obligated still to wear one because you're trying to take care of our clients and keep them safe. We're all being isolated. 
our clients are being isolated. There are countless cases where people are in nursing homes or residential care facilities and they've not had contact with their family or friends because it's been closed off for so long or they're allowing them to have contact but it's very distanced and I've heard a lot of reports that some of our elderly clients or hard of hearing clients are having a hard time with that because they're being kept at such a distance and the face masks are covering up their mouth that they're having a hard time just communicating in general the media. Uh, I, I can't go to the next slide without addressing the media a little bit and even attaching that with the lack of reliable information. There's so much stuff out there that it's hard to tell what's real and what's not real. It's hard to not be swayed or biased because of something that we've seen or heard, whether that be on the news or on a social media site that we use. Whatever it may be, it's hard to not see that and be biased in one way or another. There's a lack of resources right now. We're all aware of that. Um, there's things that were in place prior to COVID striking us down that they don't have the funding anymore and they're having to close their doors. So there's a lot of different struggles out there. We have our own self-care struggles and that's what this today is all about. We're going to talk about our self-care and how do we get better at it? Because again, I said earlier, why is it important? Why is it so hard? Well, it's important because if we can't take care of ourselves, then we struggle to take care of others. And it's so hard because it seems so simple. And I'll, I'll address some of that stuff as we go through this and why we make that so hard on ourselves. Uh, one thing I do want to point out from this slide, uh, I actually talked with Karen and Andy before we started because I was thinking about the technology that we have. And it's great. It has really aided us in being able to continue on with meeting with clients and meeting with each other and still having meetings and still having trainings and still having webinars like this. But I got to thinking, you know, I've, I've been on several WebExes and different things where that technology was also a hindrance because we dropped calls. We had WebExes end or you could hear me, but I couldn't hear you. And so I told them that if this thing drops off and I'm over here talking to myself and nobody can hear me, they need to give me a text message so I know to log back out or what have you, just like anybody else would have to. Because that is a realization of today. We never know when those things could happen and you won't always know that they've happened right away. Let's go ahead and start talking about some signs of stress. Hey, Robin. Yes, ma'am. Um, I did want to know there were a couple of comments that had come in while you were going over that last slide. Um, so one individual wrote in and added to, to the list that you had up there uh, staffing issues as a stressor. Mm -hmm. And then another individual wrote in and said, so far, it's like you've been reading my mind. <laughs> Great. Um, that was my plan. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree completely with the whole staffing issues. I think that's that's with everybody right now. And it's unfortunate. Um, I, I hear all the time with our meetings here in Missouri, even that they're they're hiring. We're we're getting full, but then by the time we're we've got full staff, it seems like somebody else has left, or we've had retirements, things like that. That that door is just ever revolving, and with our caseloads the way they are, whenever we lose one, we truly do feel it. It's not like you can have one gone and not feel it. So I I feel your pain there. I truly do, uh, and I'm sure that with that being said, you're definitely seeing some of these signs of stress for yourself too. Uh, and those of you that said I'm reading your mind, I'm sure some of these sound familiar as well. Uh, and like, I just want to put a disclaimer out here. This is not the only list of signs of stress. This is just a short list of things that you could be experiencing. Um, but many of us can probably relate to having headaches or having some kind of intestinal problems of some sort, anxiety, um, not being able to sleep or concentrate well, um, withdrawal, isolation, fatigue, all those things. Um, have any of you, and, and feel free to say yes or no, it's up to you, um, but when you've gotten home from work, have you ever just said, I just don't have it in me right now? I just don't have the energy to do all these other things. And that's part of what makes self-care hard, right? Because by the time you get home, you're tired, you're fatigued, you're overwhelmed from the day and you felt overloaded. And so when you get home, you might be trying to just withdraw or isolate for a moment just to gather your own thoughts and just to have that moment of peace to yourself. Um, that's a sign of stress. That truly is. Um, I always tell people that you should have as much energy at home as you do at work. And that sounds so hard. And I'm, I'm not a hypocrite. Uh, I will tell you guys, I am a bit of a realist. And so as I go through this, I will keep it as real as I possibly can for you. 
and I'm going to keep it real on every slide. And sometimes that hits close to home for people. And if it hits a little too close to home, feel free to step off for a while or, or take a walk away from the, the training to gather your own thoughts if you need to. Um, but I'm going to keep it real. And I'll just throw it out there for you guys. You should not make your work your complete priority. It should not become who you are. So you should have just as much energy at home as you do at work. You should have just as much um, vigor when you get there to want to do all those things that other people want you to do. Maybe your kids say, hey, come play with me. And you're like, I don't have an Emmy right now. Give me 15 minutes. And 15 minutes turns into 30, 45, and it turns into maybe tomorrow we'll do something. Well, it's not the way your life should be. Um, your work should not take over your life so much that you can't have a life of your own outside of this. And so that's what this is all about. So this whole taking care of yourself, that self-care, it's all about becoming more resistant, stress resistant. You've got to recognize your own capabilities and your own limitations. We're not superhumans. I wish we were. I wish that we could take the weight of the world on our shoulders and it would be perfectly fine every day, but we're not and we can't. And so we have to recognize what we can and cannot do. And sometimes what that means isn't what you can do in the job, it's what you can take on emotionally, what you can take on physically. So some of those limitations may be, I need a day off. I've got to have a mental health day. I've got to have a self-care day because I've hit my limit. I will tell you guys that there's this tool you can use that I absolutely love for finding out how you're doing. Because so often we put blinders on and we lie to ourselves and we say, I'm doing fine. I'm just a little tired. I'll get a good night's rest. I'll come to work the next day and I'll be good as new back to 100%. And that's not the case. I mean, we know better. We know that that's not how it's going to happen. But there's a tool called the ProQual, P-R-O-Q-O-L. And if you do a quick search on one of your search engines, you'll find that. And it's a free tool. You can go out there and take this for yourself. And it will, if you answer it honestly for yourself, it will help you see how you're doing with your compassion fatigue, your burnout, secondary trauma, all that stuff's gonna get answered in that. And like I said, be honest, be honest with yourself because nobody's gonna see it but you. And you might be surprised sometimes when you think you're doing all right, but you've answered these honestly to go, hmm, maybe I'm not quite as good as I thought. It's a good eye opener to then say, well, I need to do something about that. I need to take the next step. Part of finding that next step is finding your why. When I tell people about you got to find your why, I do this in two ways. And I'm going to challenge you guys to do it right now, too. Ask yourself why it is that you chose to get into this profession. Why did you choose to become an adult protective service worker? I would say the vast majority of you are probably answering to yourself right now because I want to help people. And I would honestly say that that should be at least one of your whys. It may not be your only why or your forever why. Remember I told you I was gonna keep it real. There are some days that even though I love my job and there are so many things about it that I truly enjoy and I want to help people and I wanna help as many as I possibly can, there are some days that because I have reached my limitations, my why has shifted to I have two six-month-old twins and a nine-year-old and I need benefits and I need money. I've got bills to pay. I got to keep my job for those reasons. My why has shifted so far away from I wanted to help people, but I have to bring it back to that. My next piece to the find your why is why is it so important to you for you to find better ways to take better care of yourself? Why is it important that you are just as vibrant at home as you are at work. What's your why for your own personal care then? Not just your why for why you're doing the job, because remember that your job's only a, a temporary part of your life. What's your why? Another way to become more stress resistant is to make healthy lifestyle choices. Now these aren't necessarily gonna be instant gratification type things. These are gonna be lifelong choices that you make, but Again, be realistic with yourselves. I haven't had a soda in years. Does that mean that I don't drink something that's not good for me? I'm sitting here at this table right now with an energy drink right in front of me. So some might argue, well, you might as well be drinking a soda because that's a whole lot better for you than that energy drink that's sitting right there. And I can't necessarily argue that. 
but that's just kind of a lifestyle choice that I made. I chose to not drink soda because it has a lot of sugar and I don't want that. My energy drink is sugar free. Yes, there are other pieces to it that aren't as good, but that was the one piece I chose out of it. I am a gym rat. I go to the gym all the time. I'm constantly working out and finding ways to do stuff like that, especially right now because the COVID era, the gyms were closed and I had to find other ways to get that outlet. And that's exactly what it was for me. Not only is it making me healthier, but it was also helping my self-care and my own resilience because it gave me that outlet and a way to just feel better. Now, some of that is almost instant gratification because I could feel that right there in that moment. I could feel some of that stress releasing. Um, I do try to eat as healthy as I can. I do try to do mental things for myself, such as taking a day off, doing mindfulness things. Um, and we'll talk about some mindfulness here in a little bit too. But those are long-term. So those healthy lifestyle and choices are, are long-term type things that you're gonna have to choose for yourselves. The other piece that I'm really gonna really stress on on this one is develop those strong connections with others. Within the field, within your coworkers, I encourage you guys to get to know each other. Get to know each other on a professional and a personal level to an extent. Now, I'm not saying cross boundaries or anything, but get to know each other because you guys are going to be the best sources of peer support that you can possibly get. When you go home and you talk with your, your significant others or your children or your friends, your neighbors, whoever it might be about the job, well, we're all bound by HIPAA, so we can't talk about certain details. And we're also in a field that we see things at a level that the average person doesn't see. So we're seeing a lot of abuse and neglect and exploitation happening that the average person wouldn't see it at that level. So we're seeing a lot of things that even if we can talk about some of the details or just in general to our, our friends, they don't truly understand what it is that we've seen, what we're dealing with, however your coworkers do. They're the ones that are right there beside you. They're seeing the stuff. They're, they're dealing with it day in and day out as well. So you can connect with them and you can you can bond and you can vent with them in ways that you can't with people who are outside of the field. So that's a good way to do things. Here in Missouri, I'm putting together a team of peer-to-peer -peer support. Uh, so it'll be people within the same field that when things happen in the job, whether that be um, an assault or you've witnessed something that was terrible or some secondary trauma has happened, um, you've been threatened, you've come across a death, whatever it may be, somebody is just going to reach out to you and check on you somebody who can relate to you on that level, not for therapy, but just to reach out and say, hey, I've heard about this, I care about you, do you wanna talk? Can I be of assistance in any way? And that's kind of what it's for, and that's why I want you guys to develop those strong connections with other people, because that does make you more resistant, or stress resistant. Hey, Robin. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to interject. We had a few more comments come in. Okay. Um, you were uh, related to the discussion of stressors. Um, someone had written in that an additional stressor is an increase of demand of wanting to have extra documentation regarding daily activities by the minute. So, for instance, being on a webinar for an hour, making a call for 12 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then there were a couple of folks, a few folks wrote in to um, agree with you when you were talking about the impacts, the symptoms of stress. And a couple of people noted, you know, having some, some digestive issues related to stress that are also kind of then becoming a stressor um, because it's, it's an impact on the ability to get work done. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with all those comments. Um, definitely more stressors. And I'll, I'll add to that. Um, we start looking at these signs of stress that we we've had and that you guys have shared. I don't want this to be a norm. I don't want this to be something that you might shake your head and say, yeah, that's me. And now it sounds like it's a normal thing because it's not a normal thing. Um, we should deal with our stress. We should ask for help. We should get things like that happening. But sometimes those signs of stress that we talked about, they turn into other things more harmful and dangerous behaviors come out of those sometimes because we aren't dealing with it the way that we should and sometimes we wind up with more maladaptive coping techniques that we're seeing our clients do them and we're trying to get them help and yet we're doing some of those same things right so it's kind of a double-edged sword and we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about how to become more stress resistant how to do some of that self-care for yourself how to maybe open your eyes to say that you're not immune to it. And yes, we're helping people, but sometimes we need that help too. 
on your screen right here, it says accept help. We have to. Yes, we're the professional. Yes, we're the, the person going out there and filling the social work role of, of helping other people. Why is it then that we're so resistant to accept help ourselves? I think sometimes for me, I put that blinder on to say, you know, I'm the person that's dealing out all these resources and help to people. So I've got to make it seem like I'm doing great for you to buy into what I'm saying you need to be able to do or you should be accepting help for. And that's not the case, you guys. We're all human beings and we all have moments of, of vulnerability and we need that help just as much. Um, and it humanizes you too to, to say that I also need help. Not necessarily that you need to tell your clients that, but to just say it to yourself. Say it to your loved ones, say it to your coworkers to say, hey, I just need a little bit of help right now. I'm, I'm also and need some of these resources that we're, we're dealing out to people. I'm laughing, you guys. I'm, I love humor. I'll even try to throw some into this as much as I possibly can because I like to laugh. I like to make others laugh. And I'm sure I have all kinds of like wrinkles between my, around my eyes because I smile and laugh so much that I'm okay with that because laughter is good for your soul. It does truly make you feel better. Um, I can remember a quote, and I'm sure I'll botch it a little bit, but it's um, either you make people laugh or you find someone who can make you laugh. For me, I like it to be both. I like to make others laugh, but I like to laugh with other people as much as I make them laugh because it just makes you feel good and it relieves stress. It does take a lot of that stuff away. There's a lot of research and study out there that talks about how the endorphins in your brain and the oxytocin um, all floods throughout whenever you're laughing and smiling and hugging people even. So all that stuff, it's backed by research, you guys. Find a good comedy. In our job, part of the nature of it is to care for others. That's what we do. We go out, we, we hear these hotlines, we see these people asking for help, we see these, these clients that are in, in desperate need sometimes of of help, resources, saving, whatever it may be that you're thinking right now, that fills your cup back up a little bit. But it doesn't fill it up enough. You get a little bit back from that, that compassion and satisfaction, but it's not as much as you give out. So you do have to be able to do some more other things for yourself too. I've already talked about accepting help. Roll with the change. The one thing that is constant and almost guaranteed in our role is that it's going to change. There's going to be different things day in and day out. Um, I've heard APS being called the unjob, right? It's unexpected, unknown, all these different uns because you just never know what the next day is going to bring. How often do we spin our wheels resisting change? We fight it. Change is hard. We've all heard that. We've all felt that change is hard. But how much do we just resist and resist and resist and just bang our head on the wall saying I don't want to change I don't like this change and yet it's going to change with or without you I've been told for years pick your battles and I hold firm to that I'm not afraid to challenge the status quo I'm not afraid to like point out stuff that I think is not working well um, but sometimes that's where it ends for me because I know there's no way I can change it but I put my two cents in to say at least I tried at least I put that out there but I also know that sometimes it's going to change without me. And so I need to just go, okay, I'm going to back off now. I've stated my piece, but I'm going to roll with it now. I'll roll with it. We'll see where this goes. Maybe I'm not being open enough to see the good within this change. And when I roll with it, then I can kind of go, okay, no, I do see some of the good. Um, maybe I still see some bad, but I can make it work for me. So roll with it, you guys. Roll with that change. Don't fight it. Pick your battles. When we talk about taking care of yourself, I've talked about some of those wellness efforts. Some of this stuff, like I said, it's it's a lifestyle choice. It's going to be an ongoing thing. You're not going to get the instant gratification out of it that people look for. You want something to happen right away. And we say, hey, if you do these things, you'll feel better. And you do it, and it doesn't happen right away. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm done with that. Nutrition's a hard one. It's easy to eat unhealthy. It sometimes seems like more work to eat healthier. It sometimes seems like it costs more money to eat healthier. And I've had people go, well, I ate a salad and I didn't feel any different after eating the salad. Well, you're not going to feel different after one time, right? So it's a lifestyle choice. You have to choose 
to continue on with those efforts and you'll get those rewards back. Uh, I told you guys I haven't had a soda in years and I haven't. I haven't had um, sugary drinks in a quite some time and it was all because I was uh, working some part-time stuff at a, at a hospital and I was working on the night shift for part-time and I had a headache. So I would drink soda, Mountain Dew, to get some caffeine in there and get rid of that headache. And then I realized that I also had a headache when I did drink it. So if I had too much caffeine, I got it. And one night I just realized that's not a good idea. It's not, it's not smart for me to be doing this to myself. And so I said, I'm not gonna drink any more soda. And then I felt better pretty quickly. It wasn't the next day, but within the next week or two, I felt a whole lot different by not drinking it. And then I had to kind of look at, well, what part of it was it that was really making me not feel good? And I realized it was just having too much sugar. So like I said, I have an energy drink in front of me right now, uh, sitting here on the table. I still drink caffeine sometimes, but I moderate it now. So I told you guys at the beginning, I'm a realist. I'm not going to tell you, you can't have caffeine. You can't have sugar. You can't have all these different things. Do things for yourself to better yourself, but do it in moderation and be fair to yourself. Be realistic. Some relaxation strategies, you've got mindfulness and meditation. And we're going to talk about both of these. Mindfulness it's achieved by focusing your awareness on the present moment, acknowledging, accepting your own feelings, thoughts in a non-judgmental manner. The one thing I really, really want to point out to you guys about mindfulness and meditation both, it, so often I hear people tell me I'm not good at it, I'm terrible, I can't do it for very long, I fail, so I just don't do it because I'm not going to be able to do it. I fail at it, and I don't like to fail. Don't fear the failure, and instead of seeing it as a failure, see it as a success. Because if you put yourself in a, in a spot where you're trying to be mindful or you're trying to be in a meditative state, or you're trying to do something like that and you recognize that your mind is wandering and you're thinking about other things, you didn't fail. In that moment that you realize that, you were mindfully in that moment. You actually succeeded in that moment and being mindful. At that point in time, you can choose to either continue on or stop at that point and say, you know what, I did my best right now. I caught myself being mindfully in the moment when I caught my thoughts wandering. I'll try again the next time. I'll try again later. I'll try again tomorrow, whatever it is. But don't fear that failure. It only gets better. You can only do better the next time. Or you don't. And that's okay too, you guys. There's there's no failure when you try this stuff. It's It's about doing your best with it and giving yourself that moment to say, I have feelings. I have these thoughts. I have all these things. And it's okay. It's okay to have any of those things, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent. We're all allowed that. So often we give ourselves these criteria that we've got to have positive thoughts. We've got to have this positivity that we're putting out there. And we don't accept anything other than the positive. And sometimes we even put that thing, that, that feeling to our clients. We go, no, no, if you're going to get upset, I don't want to talk to you. We're going to talk about positive things. We're going to stay positive. Well, that's not realistic, you guys. It's not human behavior to only be happy and pleasant. We're going to have feelings and that includes negative feelings, negative thoughts, negative sensations. Don't judge yourself for it. It's okay. But you can be mindful in those moments. Um, I will tell you guys that there are several ways that you can be mindful. You can be mindful in the way that you eat even. Uh, I have a, a social worker friend who we were in a meeting together one day and I think everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say there's those little um, bite-sized candy bars that you get at like Halloween, little bitty single wrapped bite-sized pieces. And I'm, I'm watching her and she unwraps this candy bar and she takes one bite of it. Personally, you guys, that's a bite-sized candy bar. I throw the whole thing in my mouth at one time. I don't know how to just do one bite off of that. I see her take a bite and she sets the whole thing down on the table and I see her eat this candy bar. And I know this sounds kind of creepy. I'm watching somebody eat a candy bar, but this is how it happened. So I'm watching her eat this candy bar and then I see her pick it up a little while later and take another bite off of it. It took her three bites to eat this candy bar. And after a while, I, I couldn't take it anymore. We had a nice little break and I was like, okay, I gotta ask, what's with taking three bites off of a single bite candy bar? She's like, I'm doing mindful eating. And so as I took each bite, I was fully immersing myself in that bite and feeling how that bite felt, what the chocolate tasted like, the sensations I was feeling in my body. And that's how you actually do mindfulness. You're experiencing all of those different things that you have going on. Um, now, I, I will tell you that if you choose to do that, be mindful as well about what you choose to do that with. 
So hard candy works really well because it lasts a while in your mouth and you can actually truly feel what does that candy feel like in my mouth right now? What, what sensations am I feeling? What flavors am I experiencing? What does this thing feel like with my tongue around the sides of my cheek? If you use something that melts really quickly and you're trying to like stay mindful in the moment for a long time, you're, you're stuck with this melted thing in your mouth. And so it doesn't work really well. So be careful with that. Uh, but that's, that's one way you can be mindful. Guided imagery, it's a, a great mindfulness technique and you don't have to be great at it by yourself either. There's a lot of resources out there, a lot of free ones. You can do a search for guided imagery or uh, progressive rel muscle relaxation and you'll find all kinds of stuff out there for free, you guys. It is less physical than yoga. However, yoga is a great outlet as well. And there are a lot of communities around the nation right now who are doing um, free yoga in the park or yoga and meditation, whatever it may be, they're offering it for free. You just have to be on the lookout for it. Uh, and they're doing it in some places. I've seen that they're doing it more so now because of the COVID era, because you can be outside and you can socially distance and you can spread out and still do all these things without being close to someone else. And you're still doing self-care. The cool thing about mindfulness meditation, either one, is it can be done anywhere. You can do this anywhere at any time, you guys. Some of the benefits of meditation, I'll leave this up on the screen so you can and kind of look through these. But who, who wouldn't like to have these things happen? And again, this isn't necessarily uh, instant gratification type thing. Now, if you choose to do this stuff, some of the stuff you will feel quite quickly. You might feel your heart rate slow down. You might feel happier. You might feel friendlier with people, maybe kinder. So some of that stuff can happen pretty quickly. You can do a guided meditation or a guided mindfulness exercise or a progressive relaxation, muscle relaxation before you go to bed. And sometimes that improves your sleep. Um, I do that for myself. When I have a hard time turning off my brain at night and I'm thinking about all kinds of stuff or my phone's laying there and then I go, well, I wonder if I've had any emails come in and I check my email. Well, that's, that's my personal time, but I choose to check my email and that's, that's not good for me, you guys. And so when I do that kind of stuff, I put my phone down, I close my eyes and I just do some sort of breathing exercise where I count my breaths in or I count my breaths out or I do um, this technique that I like that's called ah, va. So you just, as you breathe in, you're saying the word ah, and as you breathe out, you, breathe, you say the word va to yourself. And you can touch your fingertips together for each time that you say one of those as well. If you're doing that, you're mindfully in the moment and you'll find that you can't think about all these other things that are bothering you in that moment because you're focused on your, your breath and the words that go along with the breath and you'll, you'll feel all that stress kind of start to melt away. I think we've got enough time that I would actually like to do a short progressive muscle relaxation with you guys. Um, so I'll start off by saying, put yourself someplace comfortable. So if you're at work, maybe get in a comfortable position in your chair. Uh, if you're at home, you could even lie down on the floor, on your couch, wherever you're at, someplace that you're not going to be interrupted while we do this. And it's going to be a very quick one. We're not going to do your entire um, head to toe scan. We're just going to, we're just going to do the head. We're just going to do like your head and neck area just to kind of get an idea of how this kind of works. Um, but if you're ready and you're in a comfortable position, we're going to go ahead and get started. So allow yourself to focus on just your body. And for right now, like I said, I want you to focus on just your upper body. If you start to feel your mind wander, that's okay. Remember, it's not a failure. You're mindfully in that moment at that point in time. Bring yourself back. Bring yourself back to the muscle that I'm talking about and that we're working on in that moment. So it's a start. I want you guys to take a deep breath in through your abdomen. I want you to feel your, your stomach to really fill and expand with this, not just your lungs, but your, your whole abdomen and it just expand with this. And as you take that deep breath in, I want you to hold that breath for just a couple of seconds, two or three seconds. And then I want you to let it out slowly. Do this again. And as you breathe in this time, I want you to notice your stomach filling out and your lungs filling with air. I want you to notice what that feels like for yourself. And again, as you exhale, I want you to notice what that feels like. I want you to imagine any tension that you have in your body being released and just leaving your body. I want you to again breathe in. 
and exhale. Feel your body already starting to relax. As we go through each one of these steps, I want you to remember, keep breathing. So the breathing is what helps you relax all those muscles and all that tension. So don't stop breathing on me. So let's start with tightening the muscles in your forehead. Raise your eyebrows as high as you can. Hold them there. Hold them there for a few seconds. And I want you to very quickly release them. Let your eyebrows drop back down. Feel the tension release from what was up there and just being held tightly. Now I want you to smile as big as you can. Feel your mouth and your cheeks tense up. And I want you to hold them there and hold it kind of tense that way for just a few more seconds. Now release and feel how your face now is softer. Those muscles are no longer tense. You can feel the difference. Now I want you to tighten your eye muscles. Squint your eyelids shut as tight as you can. Hold those there for a few seconds. Now release them. You can open your eyes. And feel that tension that's no longer in that tightening of that muscle. Now I want you to gently pull your head back, just like you're looking at the ceiling, and hold it there for just a few seconds. Feel that tightness in your neck. Now release, allow your head to come back, kind of the neutral. And you feel that tension that was in your neck kind of just floating away as well. Now just take a few breaths in, hold them as you bring them in for a little while. Just a few seconds. Let them out slowly. As you take these breaths in, I want you to count how many seconds you breathe in. Hold that breath for just a few seconds. And as you breathe that breath out, I want that breath to take at least two seconds longer to release than you did to bring it in. Take a few more of these breaths in and out. All right, I'm gonna invite you guys to stretch out a little bit if you like to, or if you feel comfortable just the way you are, just sit there, um, take a few breaths, and we're going to conclude that portion of the progressive re muscle relaxation. And like I said, that was just for the head and the neck, not the whole body. Um, I was afraid if I did the whole body with you guys, you'd fall asleep on me and we wouldn't finish this presentation. Uh, but that just kind of gives you an idea how simple this can be for yourselves. Uh, it's not super hard, and if you can't do this on your own by yourself, like I said, just go on a search engine and look it up. Go to YouTube. There are plenty of videos and, and guided things that will help you out with that. All right, we've got a few more slides we're going to go over here um, before I open it up for any questions. But I do want to focus on your, your off-duty time. I want you guys to make yourself a priority. Our work is really important but so are we. And we need to be able to separate our work and our home life. Find some way to turn off the work you and turn on the home you. Whether that is at the end of the day, you're driving home, you find a spot somewhere along the way on the road, you find a certain tree, a certain house, barn, whatever you've got. And you say, when I pass this point, I'm no longer gonna be the work version of me. I'm gonna turn that off. My wife and I do a 15 minute phone conversation at the end of the day, almost every day. And that's kind of our time to say, how was your day? What did you do? What was stressing? And we don't script it like that. That's just how it works. And after that 15 minute phone call is over, the rest of our evening, for the most part, is devoted to just us and our family. And that works out well for us. The days that we don't do that, however, much of the evening does come back around to work and we talk about work more than I'd like to and more than she'd like to. And at that point, it's almost like you didn't leave work at all. And you didn't have that time away to do any self-care or to do anything that was for yourself. Now, this is where people challenge me all the time and they say, well, Robin, I don't have time to do self-care. My challenge back to you will be, you don't have time not to, and it's all about making realistic expectations for yourself and making yourself a priority. 
when we have bad things happen in our lives, we have to take somebody to a hospital, we have to do this, that, or the other that we didn't plan on, we make time for it. We find a way to make that happen. We don't just say, well, I wasn't in the script today to go to the hospital for a broken bone. You're gonna have to wait till tomorrow. We'll schedule it in then. You go right then and there because you made it a priority. Make yourself a priority too. Now, again, that sounds like something you might wanna go, well, Robin, I don't have enough time to do that. You do. You just have to find a way to make that realistic for yourself. I'm not asking you guys to go on a, a week-long vacation all by yourself and leave your family at home and all your, your home um, things that you have to get done off to the side. You still have all those things you have to do. Don't get me wrong, but make them realistic. If that means that you're going to devote five minutes of your, your evening to doing a guided imagery thing or a meditation or to reading a book, listening to some music, doing something that interests you. Five minutes is not much, you guys. How much time do you spend off duty scrolling through your phone, looking at social media or watching Netflix? Devote a little bit of that time to just you. And don't get me wrong either, part of what I just said can be part of your time. So again, be realistic. If that's what makes you feel rejuvenated is to actually sit and watch a comedy, sit and watch a comedy. If it makes you feel good to kind of relax and kick back and see what your family and friends are doing on social media, do that for a few minutes. But make them realistic expectations. I do want you to pursue some interests. Find some ways to do this. Don't settle for excuses from yourself. It's easy to make them. It's easy to say I don't have time. It's easy to say I have too many obligations. It's easy to say all those things. Don't settle for that. Make it a commitment. And find a way to have that accountability, whether that is you've 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 put a, a timer or a, an alarm on your phone or you've you've told a significant other a friend a co-worker to be your a person that's going to hold you accountable to say hey did you go for that walk you said you were going to go for whatever it is find some way to hold yourself accountable and again you guys i'm i'm a realist make this fun self-care should not be work Self-care should be fun. It should be rewarding. It should be something that we look forward to because it's the things that make us happy. Self-care is what rejuvenates us. Make it fun. Don't make this something that if you do set that alarm that it becomes, oh, now it's time that I have to do this self-care thing because then it doesn't work. So make it things that you enjoy. Make it realistic. And as you get better at it, you can increase those expectations for yourself. So above all else though, I do want you to practice this because you are not your work. You are professionals in the field and I, as well as all the clients around the, the nation, we appreciate all the work that you do, but we also want you to have a happy, healthy life as well. Um, you can't take care of others without taking care of yourself too. Make yourself a priority. Separate your work from yourself. And always, always, always remember that you matter too. And with that being said, I'm going to open this up for any kind of questions you guys may have. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, we do have a few questions and then a, a few comments that had come in as well. So the first question that came in, um, and you had addressed this a bit in one of your previous slides, but um, the question is, I try so hard to only work during work hours for self-care. It is impossible to not work outside of working hours. What are some better ways to leave my clients at work instead of taking them home in my head? Um, I struggle with that as well. I, I'll be completely honest with you. I go home and some days I do great. I can take my computer and turn it off, take my phone and put it down. And I don't think twice about work. And there are other days that I really struggle. And the days that I really struggle, it has to be a conscious effort on my part to say, okay, it's five o'clock. My day has ended now. I'm going to turn my computer completely off because most days I just lock the screen. And then it's so easy that when I come back by it and go, oh, all I have to do is put in my password and I can check it real quick. That's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to make a quick little look, make sure there's nothing important that can't wait till tomorrow. But Unless we're on call and we have something coming in like that, guess what? It can wait till tomorrow. It can wait till then. And it's just us having to remind ourselves and hold ourselves accountable to say, my work hours are over now and I am just as important as my clients, as all these other things that are going on and I need to make myself a priority too. So that's probably my best piece of advice is just make it a conscious effort to say, I'm turning it off. I'm turning it off right now. 
Great, thank you. And someone else had written in um, while you were answering that, Robin, my Fitbit holds me accountable for my self-care. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next question is, we who are working the front line tend to, tend to support and want room for self-care practices within the workplace. Culturally, upper management seems to only support self-care practices in theory, such as station, stationing training, such as this one. But when staff engage in self-care, stress-relieving activities in the workplace during the workday, these activities are viewed as lazy, fidgety, or non-purposeful. How do we frontline workers and mid-level management get upper management on board with fully supporting self-care activities in the office throughout the day as workers need the relief? I think that's a struggle that we, we see everywhere. Uh, some places are coming around a whole lot faster than others. Uh, and unfortunately, in, in some places, it, it takes a lot more effort to get them to recognize that. And in other cases, sometimes it takes something drastic happening before they go, yeah, I think we need to have some of the stuff put in place. I think it's a lot of education. I think it's just a, a lot of, of having to explain why it's so important. And if you take care of your staff, they take care of you. And the more your staff are taken care of, then the more they're going to take care of your clients too. You have less turnover, less um, attrition happening, and so it, it's a win-win all the way around to let your staff take care of themselves. Uh, and I got to say that Missouri is not perfect by any means, but I, I truly do feel that our management promotes that and, and lives it, that if you need to do something for yourself, do that for yourself. And we still have obligations to meet, um, but I, I alluded to earlier a team that I'm putting together for a peer-to-peer -peer support. And that's something I, I'd been pushing for quite some time, and we finally got some buy-in. And it's, it's not something that just happens overnight. It does take time to get people on board. So I, I just I, I'd say don't give up. Keep trying to push that information out there to them. Um, invite them to join in on some stuff. So it's not just they're looking at it as this person's doing this thing and they look lazy. They look like they're fidgeting. Invite them to do it with you. Uh, educate them that way. Great, thank you so much. Um, while you were answering that one, someone had written in a comment, don't mean to brag, but our office has dogs and allows dogs in. It's a huge stress reliever. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, the next question um, is related to the symptoms of stress. Um, and it's, is eyelid twitching potentially caused by stress? Potentially, um, yeah, it could be. I'm not a medical professional, so I might advise you to go see a doctor. Um, but yeah, it definitely could be like one of those um, ticks or a, a twitch that happens from stress. Great, thank you. And then the next question, if you need some type of professional help, how do you suggest seeking that out and not overlapping our work providers with our personal lives? Um, if your work offers an employee assistance program, I would check into that first because uh, that's part of your benefits package and there's a lot of great trained people out there. Um, now, I, I do strongly advise you guys to seek out help when you need that and see what your insurance covers because it can get expensive. But then the, also there's there are sources out there that they're free. Um, they may not be everything that you need, but they may get you started. And there's there's apps even that you can download and at least have an outlet um, trained um, listeners that can listen to you and let you vent, uh, things like that. And that's a, that's a good starting point. But if, if you need to, I would definitely urge you to seek out the professional help and start with your insurance and see what that covers. Great, thank you. And then the, um, the last thing is not a, a question, but a comment, kind of an added idea. Um, this individual wrote in, reading before bed and completely unplugging helps me and result in restful sleep usually. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Right? And there's a lot of research out there that says you should turn any kind of screen time off a certain amount of time before bed because it does help your brain kind of slow down. So there's a lot of, a lot of good research behind that. It's a good practice. Great. And we did get one more question that came in. Let me see. Um, the question is, I attended this for myself and for the county workers I support. What would you advise about the breathing exercise in a larger group setting with the county staff? I really enjoyed the exercise and exercise for the first time in a long time. 
Uh, are you talking about the uh, progressive muscle relaxation? Is that what they're commenting to? I believe so. Okay. Um, it, it's a, a great activity actually to do with a large group. If you can do it during a meeting, I know right now a lot of our meetings are being done virtually, so everybody gets to be in the comfort of their own home even. Uh, but even if you're in the office with people, I've done this where um, all the staff just kind of picked a spot on the wall and they sat down on the floor and stretched their legs out and just got comfortable. And if you had somebody who felt comfortable actually leading that progressive muscle relaxation or the guided imagery or whatever you're going to do, allow them to do it. Otherwise, there's all kinds of resources out there, uh, whether that be a website that gives you a script or you go to YouTube and you just push play and everybody gets to do it at that point. Uh, so that's it's it's a great activity. and I do encourage you to do that as well. Wonderful, thank you. And then we had a couple of folks write in to ask if they could get your email again. Sure. Is that on one of these slides? I see that it isn't showing anymore. Um, this oh, is no. Andy. There I can... Oh, there you go. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And it doesn't look like we have any other questions at this time. All right. Um, so, yes, thank you so much again, Robin, for presenting on this topic. It's, it's always timely, but especially now. Um, and thank you all so much for um, attending this webinar today. Hope it was helpful. And yeah, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.